All right, everybody, I just wanted to go over a couple of slides because we did some hands-on stuff on Friday. So just in case you like going through the slides, this one is for you. So I'm starting, as you can see, on slide 11, and that's going to bring us to this other fiber pathways from the motor cortex slide. So if you just draw your attention to this bottom picture on the right, you see the cerebral cortex and a variety of different um, downward paths coming from it. So you see the cerebral cortex labeled, we see the substantia nigra labeled, the subthalamic nucleus, and then we see these different colors telling us about which pathway they are. So we have talked about the reticular system gen in generalities, but we talked about the vestibular system um, and the vestibulospinal tract. We'll just go over uh, really quickly. And then there's the associated rubrospinal tract, which is really just an adjacent pathway to the corticospinal tract. Um, if essentially that's not available for things to travel down, then the rubrospinal tract, which is named that for rubor, it's a Latin word for red, um, the rubrospinal tract goes through the red nucleus, which makes it a little bit different, although it is very just adjacent to the corticospinal tract, which is the main outflow pathway in the brain. So some other fibers that are coming from the motor cortex, uh, we have the Betz cells, which we remember from... Um, the motor cortex, those are some inhibitory cells. They're really big, they're very big. And because they're inhibitory, they can hyperpolarize cells around them, which means they can inhibit adjacent regions of a motor um, trace or a motor element to sharpen the boundaries of the signal so that you don't get any unwanted movements, any shaking, any swaying side to side. The BET cells help to generate the smoothest movement possible by inhibiting adjacent neurons. There are motor pathways that go to the caudate and the putamen. Um, the caudate and the putamen are two areas of the uh, center of the brain. I study them quite a bit. Uh, there are some areas that are associated in habit formation and habitual learning. Um, and they travel there uh, from the motor cortex to the caudate, and they go to the brainstem and the spinal cord. These are striatal areas, so again, they're involved in habit formation and new memory formation. So a way to tell if things have made it from different areas of um, the caudate, there's like a dorsal and ventral region, if you think about the first day you came to Duville when you were probably paying attention to everything around you and looking at the signs and trying to figure out where to park, you were using a very specific part of your brain and learning a new skill. And then there might be some days where you end up in the parking lot and you don't even remember driving to school and you're having a hard time remembering how you got there, or what route you took. That means you've made what we call a dorsal to ventral shift in this pathway where you no longer are learning something new. You're now just housing that as a memory. So those uh, pathways help in the housing of a newly acquired learning or habitual pathways and then travel to the cord for motor output or to the brainstem um, for more simple types of reflexive behaviors. Um, what you're seeing in that picture that just popped up is uh, a nice anatomical representation where in the center we see these striatal areas and some nice areas. There's the caudate and the putamen right above the thalamus in that picture. The red nuclei, oops, I went too quickly, is if you look in this picture on the midbrain slice, you see the red nucleus. Um, one thing I didn't make very super clear, but I will give you a nice coloring sheet, so hopefully that makes it clear, is um, the pyramidal tract is the old school name for the corticospinal pathway. And corticospinal is a pretty great word because it tells you where the pathway starts and where it terminates. Um, the reason we use the pyramidal word is it goes through these areas in the brain that they refer to as the pyramids. Um, the red nuclei is named for the color that it is. So the rubrospinal tract are tracts that originate from the motor cortex but then travel through the red nuclei through the rubrospinal tract, which is right next to or adjacent to the corticospinal pathway. There's the reticular activating areas, which we call the reticular substance, and the vestibular nuclei of the brainstem, which diverge in these lower regions of the cerebellar 
slices and either travel via the cord in the reticulospinal tract or vestibulospinal tract. Some that we uh, played with in the yoga room are very local, so they just go to the cerebellum via the reticulocerebellar tracts so that we can help keep our balance and orient ourselves in space. The reticular substance, uh, we call that the reticular activating areas. When you are awake, that is on. When you're sleeping, it is off. So the reticular areas um, are called that because they activate you. So that's kind of what gets activated when your alarm gets up in the morning and you shift from being asleep to being awake. All right, then we have things that synapse, uh, just fibers from the motor cortex and the pontine nuclei. Pontine means it's in the pons. So nuclei is also a group of cell bodies that do the same thing. So it's just a group of cells in the pons area. And then pontero or cerebellar fibers go to the cerebellum. So that means pons, cerebellum, traveling together. So those would go to elicit local balance type of actions. And some of these fibers from the motor cortex go to the inferior olivary nuclei. And olivocerebellar fibers go to the cerebellum to help us integrate our sensory information with a balance against gravity. If we go to the next slide, we see the motor cortex uh, that we've talked so much about and the corticospinal tract um, is something we spent the most time on. There is also the, this rubrospinal tract, and the full name of it is the corticorubral tract, which are these motor fibers that originate in the motor cortex, and they first terminate on the red nucleus. Then you see the second order neurons picking up in the red nucleus and either going to cerebellar areas or down uh, adjacent to the corticospinal tract. So this is just a fiber tract from the primary motor cortex. It goes through this corticorubral tract, which means for, from the cortex to the red nucleus. They synapse in the magnocellular portion, which means large cell portion of the red nucleus. Uh, this is also where you find other large neurons like Bet cells, and that gives rise to the rubrospinal tract. So beginning in the red nucleus and then traveling down the cord, it decussates or crosses in the lower brainstem, and it goes right next to the corticospinal tract. So the best way to think about this is just like the two elevators that get you up to the third floor where we have class. If one of those is taken, you can take the other one. It's not a big deal, right? They're they're just adjacent things, so if you cannot access the main motor outflow unit, the corticospinal pathway, you can take the red or rubrospinal pathway to get to the same type of cord areas that you would um, otherwise. These themselves terminate on interneurons in the cord gray matter, which has a lot to do with uh, control of muscles in reflexes and spasticity, which we'll talk about on Monday in class. Okay, here you see on the left the slides associated or brain sections associated with the rubrospinal tract. So this doesn't include the serorubro uh, tract or corticorubro. So we have red nucleus, we have this immediate kind of decussation in these lower areas. We're going to travel down the rubrospinal, rubroreticular fibers, and go through this. Um, nice lateral area of the brain until um, we get to the lateral fununculus and eventually ventral root nerve fibers will pop out to go to any of the motor areas that will be innervated. So that magnocellular portion has somatic representation of the body. So in the same way we talked about the homunculus and other brain areas, uh, this has something simu similar, meaning if there's electrical stimulation of an area of the magnocellular portion, you'll get a contraction of a single muscle um, or a small group of muscles. It's not as fine as primary motor, but it's a pretty good uh, representation of the motor units. If the corticospinal tract is cut and rubrospinal is intact, so in this case, it's only damage to the pyramidal system, you have movements, but really fine motor control of hands and fingers are impaired because the primary motor cortex has the largest mapping of this. Um, the rubrospinal can't take all of that really fine mapping at once. Wrist movements are intact. 
if both the cortico and rubro are blocked, the wrists are affected. So if only one of them is working, you will have wrist movements. If we take both corticospinal and rubrospinal together, we call them the lateral motor system of the cord. Very good term. To the side muscle affecting system of the spinal cord. We said this in class. I just want you to remember that anything that is not technically pyramidal, so not corticospinal. So all of those different tracks that I talked to you through a little while ago, all of those are considered extra pyramidal systems. They're not part of the corticospinal tract that goes through these, uh, these pyramids. They're really interwoven. They have a lot of interplay with one another as we experienced ourselves. So the term extra pyramidal, even though it persists in the literature and in clinical medicine, especially having to do with the side effects of antipsychotics, um, we refer to this as extra pyramidal uh, side effects, which can tell you it's one of these 12 different pathways. So it's not a really great term, but just keep that in mind. You will hear extra pyramidal side effects quite often. All right, and then when we have excitation of the cord, if we take a section of the cortex and we cut out a block of it, it can be organized based on the types of neurons that are in each area, which are then organized by where the input comes from. So you're seeing here on the right these six different levels of the primary motor cortex, and they're just numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. And there's different types of neurons and inputs or outputs in each area. Um, each of these columns, they function as a unit. Each column has six layers. So pyramidal cells are the cells that uh, project to corticospinal fibers in the fifth layer. All of the input is layers two and four. So anything coming into the system is layers two and four. Layer six, as you can see from this picture with the arrows on it, that is off to the other areas of the cortex. Um, so that's your output station. So things are coming in and being integrated throughout these different levels, and then they have an output station in the sixth level. There's two different types of populations that are excited by columns. We'll talk about these more on Monday as well. We have dynamic neurons and static neurons. This is the same thing we talk about with dynamic stretching versus static stretching. So when something is in stasis, it means that it's not really moving or fluctuating where something dynamic is. So dynamic neurons fire really quickly at a high rate uh, for a short time at the beginning of contraction. So when you're just developing a force, these dynamic neurons, they're firing. A lot of these um, neurons in the red nucleus, they're dynamic neurons. Static neurons, they kick in and start firing at a slower rate when they do fire to maintain the force of contraction. So that could be because you want to pick up your pencil. Your primary motor cortex is going to work with your associated premotor areas and association areas to plan your movement. They get you oriented with space then your corticospinal pathway is going to send a, an image uh, or excitation down for what you need to do to execute that movement. And initially the dynamic neurons will fire as you are initially contracting your fingers to pick up your pencil. And then as you're holding your pencil, the static neurons fire to keep the contraction going so you can complete your movement. Okay, then we have on the next slide um, these input-output pathways. So if we look at the bottom, we see these tracks that we've been talking about, um, or to the side as well, because we have these lateral tracks. So on the very bottom, we have the vestibulospinal and reticulospinal tracks, um, tectospinal and reticulospinal, a little bit above that in pink. Um, we have reticulospinal tract also in green, rurospinal tract in blue, and then the corticospinal tract from the pyramidal cells in this orangish type of color. So you see even looking here that there's a lot of overlap in the systems. So you have input coming in through these, um, 
these roots, these sensory neurons or proprio-spinal neurons that are telling you something about position or sensation, those are integrating with information from um, the motor systems. And all of these things will fire together with an anterior motor, motor neuron that we'll talk more about um, Monday, like most other things I mentioned, to get uh, some activation from a motor nerve so that you can have a motor output. So these are input to anterior motor neurons. They are located in the cervical enlargement. Fingers and hands are represented direct synapse on anterior motor neurons, and it's a direct route for muscle contraction. So when you do stimulate one of these spinal motor neurons, you will get a direct motor output. The brain stem is the lowest portion of the brain. Uh, this it contains all of the areas that you definitely cannot live without. We talk about these in very deep detail in advanced physiology too, because these pontine and midbrain and medulla centers, especially the medulla, they help to control all of the things that keep you alive every day. So your breathing, your heart rate, your GI tract types of uh, peristaltic movements and churning movements, stereotype movements, um, so they're called stereotypies. They're things that you do just naturally or reflexively that you don't really think about. So that could be chewing, that could be walking, just very simple, specific movements that are maintained even if there's no cortical output, um, lip smacking, blinking, things of that nature, the equilibrium we talked about briefly, and also the eye movements. So the brainstem will talk about quite a bit. It's technically an extension of the spinal cord. Um, the pons in the midbrain are technically part of this brainstem enlargement. Um, there are some trick questions about that on your boards. We'll talk about that later. But generally, those are the areas and we talk in very deep detail about these next semester. OK, finally, we just have the support against gravity nuclei. And those involve a couple of different tracts. Uh, we have the medial vestibulospinal tract, the pontine reticulospinal tract, lateral vestibulospinal, and medullary reticulospinal. Whenever you see pontine, that means it's associated with the pons. Whenever you see vestibular, it means it's associated with the inner ears. And medullary means it's associated with the medulla. So the reticular nuclei, they're divided into pontine and medullary groups. They work antagonistically to one another. So one turns things on, one turns things off. There's the pontine reticular system. So it's excitatory transmission through the re pontine reticulospinal tract. Um, the medullary reticular system, um, inhibitory si signals that go to axial muscles, that uses the medullary reticulospinal tract. And then the vestibular nuclei, which sends excitatory signals to anti-gravity muscles, that uses the lateral and medial vestibulospinal tracts. Woof. Okay. Just to finish up, we spoke about all of these pieces and looked at a model, and you also have a handout, but I just want to be very clear about the parts of the vestibular apparatus. We have our three semicircular canals, anterior, lateral, posterior, the enlargement at the end of those. Those are the ampullas, and inside of them are the cupolas. The vestibule is this large connecting area that the vestibular nerves do attach to. And then the cochlear area, as you learned about in hearing. So the vestibular apparatus, as we talked about in class, it's a sensory organ. It detects equilibrium. So when your head is moving, these are embedded in the bone, in the temporal bone. So the functional nation, or nature of this is the membranous labyrinth, which is the functional portion. And the semicircular canals, the utricle and the saculae are what will be excited when there is a change in body orientation. So these areas of excitation are going to always be in the enlargements of these areas. So these saccules, the maculae with their staticonia, and then the utricles, um, those are all in these enlargements. So the crista ampullaris, those are the areas associated with that big endolymph in the semicircular ducts. So we've got this cupola area, there's hair cells there, and those connect to nerve fibers to give you ideas about sense of direction or equilibrium in space. 
And then we have the other cells of the maculae with their staticonia, so their crystal and gelatinous layer, also overlaying hair cells, sending messages down nerve fibers for, um, for forward momentum. The maculae is our thing that we talk the most about. This is a really cool structure. It is located on the inner surface of each enlargement or utricular saccule. It tells you when you're standing versus lying down versus bending back. Um, it's covered with a gelatinous layer with these carbonate crystals, the staticonia. So when this gelatinous layer moves, it goes in the direction of gravitational pull. So thousands of hair cells, they project um, into this gelatinous layer and eventually they come together with the vestibular nerve so that we can have a message about which directionality the body is oriented in. So very simply on the next slide, here's the head in the neutral position, here's the maculae, here's a staticonia on endolymph, gravity is just pushing it down, there's no signal. In the case that the head is tilted back, we get this kind of sense that we might fall. So gravity is pushing the hairs um, in the direction of the kinocilium, which will lead to depolarization. And that gravity uh, effect is going to be on the otolith in the gelatinous layer, which will pull the hair cells along with it to give us the sense of directionality. The next slide is uh, the macula with the staticonia. So the staticonia are these nice calcium carbonate crystals. We have the gelatinous layer, the hair cells, and then the hair cells connected to nerves, which will go form the vestibular nerve when they all converge together. Taken together, the staticonia and the gelatinous material, we call that the otolith, so the earpiece, essentially. The directional sensitivity here in these pieces, each hair cell, there's 50 to 70 stereocilia and then one large cilium um, called the kinocilium. When you bend towards it, it depolarizes, so that means the head is going back. When you bend away from it, it hyperpolarizes. We uh, had some examples of this in class, um, and so just remember bending down versus uh, bending back. The semicircular ducts, we also talked about these in pretty good detail too. They're arranged in 90 degree angles against one another, anterior, posterior, and lateral. Uh, the, they are, again, arranging these angles to one another. So here it's written out for you what we did in class. Um, so we have head tilt, we have nod, and we have no. So when these move along with the skull, the endolymph, which is heavy and gelatinous, goes through these canals and will end up stimulating the sensory receptors when um, the fluid comes into contact with them. And it gives your brain this directional um, proprioceptive type of signal. <clears throat> so here is the enlargement at the end of each semicircular duct. There's the ampulla with the cupola and then the crista ampullaris inside of it. We've got the hair cells there and then the nerves. So it goes through the ducts and through this enlargement of the ampulla. When you rotate your head, the ducts rotate with it. The fluid is really thick and static. So it's going to um, go and excite these areas of the crista ampullaris and then get this message sent to the brain about which direction your head is in or your body is in in relation to gravity. There is also the thrust response which we got a little peek into with our sprint uh, demonstration the other day. So when you are accelerating, you might get a disequilibrium signal because you are, you're kind of static. Well, in this case, you, your body perceives that you are if you're sitting um, in something like a car or an airplane but the otolith are being dragged in one direction. So it feels like you're falling and you feel kind of nauseous when this happens. If you think about when you got car sick, your mom or your grandma or somebody would say to lean forward and put your head between your legs, that was to get you away from this disequilibrium signal. So that does um, have a scientific backing. The detection of head rotation, uh, this is a pretty crazy study, it's uh, very depressing. Uh, in this study, when they were trying to figure out how uh, neurons work to tell us about rotation, they had used some cats that were at the SPCA, so they were already kind of scheduled to be put down. So the scientists took these cats and um, they 
anesthetize them. So they were passed out. They couldn't feel any pain, um, but they were still alive. And what they did was put them on a spit, essentially. Um, so in the same way, like a rotisserie chicken would be on a spit and it turns around. They would like take these animals to the spit and then turn it very slowly. And then they would measure um, action potential propagation from the neurons in these areas. And if you look at this graph, we have impulses per second on the Y and then seconds down on the X. So the first thing uh, on the graph, it says tonic level of discharge. So that's before any rotation of the animal happened. This is just your brain telling you that you are doing something. You're just normal. You're at tone is where that tonic comes from. It's your normal tone of discharge. When rotation began, so when they first started rotating the animal, you'll see that there's an immediate uh, depolarization and a lot of impulses being fired off per second. And then even as rotation continues at the same speed and rate, we have this really big, steep decline in the amount of impulses per second because these do adapt very quickly. The most important thing that this tells you is that you need to know when you start moving, once your brain knows that you're moving, it's not as important for the brain to attend to. When the rotation stops, we go back to this normal tonic level of discharge, and then there is the typical hyperpolarization for things to reset for a couple of seconds before we get back to the normal tone. So signals go down even as rotation continues. We just call that simple adaptation. Um, so we know pain receptors don't really adapt. It still hurts when somebody punches you the third or fourth time, doesn't matter. Um, proprio proprioceptive signals, they do uh, give you some adaptation. The final slide is just looking at all of the integration of these vestibulospinal and rubrospinal red nuclei tracts all together and uh, traveling down these lateral tracts in the brain. All right, so when I see you on Monday, you can answer this question for me. Um, so static equilibrium, meaning if you are moving or not, is it the semicircular canals, the macula, the utricle, or the cochlear duct? There's one really wrong answer. There's two that are kind of similar. And there's one, and uh, if you don't know it, you would pick that one. So good luck, everybody. I'll see you Monday.